Try before. Before again? Okay, here. Well, there is hence G as this shape with A plus square root of this stuff. Yes. <laughs> and then in the, in the slide after, we write that G of to the minus 1 of A is gamma T, and gamma T is A to A plus EB, AB. Yes. And B is this value. But it seems to be that gamma is G of A, not G to the minus 1 of A. Because if you, sub if you substitute A in Z in the previous form, in the slide before, you obtain A to A plus IB. In okay, let's, let's try this out, because... Uh, I know that gamma has to be G minus 1 of A. Okay. So something else has gone wrong. Okay. Let's see what has gone wrong. So this is the Lovner evolution. It becomes singular when the denominator is 0. So it is singular at g equals to a. Therefore, if I invert this, at this point, z which is equal to g minus 1 of a, I have singularity. And this point, by definition, is gamma of t. This we cannot change. It happens here. Now, the problem which is possible, I haven't been, I haven't checked it, is if this map somehow has a problem. Let's see. G of uh, T of Z is equal to A square root of Z minus A part 2 plus 40. Plus? Yeah, but... Uh, you're thinking... It has to be plus 40, I think. Is it 40? Minus 4 much is 40? Yes, uh, I can see what you mean. Minus 40. So let's say g of a is equal to a plus 2i root t. So which is right because as t goes up, it goes on the imaginary axis. Yeah. So this is a plus 2i root t. And this is a. This point is a. Now what we want to see is g minus 1 of uh, this guy. How can I do that? So what I want to say is g minus 1 of a is equal to a plus 2i root t. Huh. Shouldn't it be uh, gamma 
y equal to g to the minus 1 because you wrote g equal to g to the minus 1, right? Yeah. You are saying here? Yes. Here I only put instead of z, a. Okay, so no, no. So from here it follows that A is G minus 1 of A plus 2I root T. So this immediately implies that to be true. This is true, so that is not true. Something is uh, strange here. Always easier to look at here. <laughs> when you teach, you realize that next to the blackboard, you are at a disadvantage to the student. <laughs> the student looks at it from here. <laughs>
So something is wrong here. I start from this equation. This one is correct. I set B equal to 0, which is, is the origin of time. So I end up with this equation. And that equation is solved to give G equals to A plus A squared plus 4T. But I have a boundary condition that at t equals to 0, I need g of 0 to equal z. In this case, it is equal to a plus the square root of a squared. So the solution is to change this constant here into z minus a. A squared, and if I take the positive root, a goes out and I get z. So the correct g of t and z is equal to a plus z minus a squared plus 40. So something has gone wrong here. I don't understand why I have got it wrong. Something is wrong here because yeah, I have a Z. Three. There's a class instead of minus four. Yeah, so this is correct. This I know to be correct because I've worked with that. Maybe it comes out of this solution. This is now correct. Now, to answer the problems from there. GT of A now becomes A plus 2 root T and it means that you started from A but G is mapping it to somewhere here which is A plus twice root T. However, the tip gamma of t satisfies that g of t of gamma of t must equal a, which is, in fact, this expression. So if I put in there, I must have a plus gamma minus a squared plus 4t So it means that comma minus 1a squared plus 4t is equal to 0. So I get comma equal to a twice root 
Price I root T. But to get this answer, I have to choose the positive root, the negative root. Yes, and the, the problem sheet I gave you was to, for you to attempt solving it for any other functional. So a simple function like just t, and you see how difficult it is. So in fact, uh, I tried very much myself over these years to find another function of t which I can analytically solve, but I couldn't. <laughs> It would be nice to have one. OK, now? OK, another question? OK, let's do a problem then. Let's do a problem. So in percolation, n s of p is equal to probability that a connected cluster of size S at RQ at RQ at on probability P exists. So it is, uh, you say, what is the, I have my, the, I turn the squares on and off with P, probability P. What is the probability that I suddenly find a cluster of size S? Hmm. Is it uh, a side percolation? Uh, at the moment, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. So then it's the probability to find at least one cluster or? Uh... No, not at least. There are, uh, that you find, you just randomly find a cluster of size S. You have all these clusters, some of them are size S. Divide them by the total, that will be an SP. This we know is of this shape. So has a power law, but big clusters are reduced. Yeah?
and theta Theta tends, tends to zero as P reaches PC from below. So here P is smaller than PC. As you reach PC from below, theta goes to zero. So that at the critical value, you have a, a scaling behavior. Here is the problem. Do this for one-dimensional percolation. Calculate this guy. This is the two-dimensional version. Why should I in my salary help? He's playing with his phone. <laughs> I'm a terrible professor in Iran. Here you have democracy. We don't have democracy in Iran. So students can be subjected to extreme force. کاغذم نداری نه برو بیار ایرانی ها دیگه شروع میکنن حل کردن شما هم مرزت خوب نیست ها مداد کاغذت دستت بگیر Do the partial differentiation. Let me see the final answer. Can we assume uh, P equals to PC to get that form? You don't need to. For any P, you can do it. This can be done for any. Right, that way. No, that way is in two dimensions. But you can I apologize. Yeah, that way, that form is for two dimensions. In one dimension, completely different shape. Okay. Yeah. This I gave you for knowledge. But when you calculate NS NSFP in one dimension, you get a very different form. But you can write it in that way. So write it in that way. The next step is after you've done this, which you have, what is the characteristic
cluster size. So do part, do this now. ایراد نداره شما کارتو بکن So the answer is NSP <coughs> is equal to 1 minus P squared P to the power S. If somebody doesn't answer, doesn't understand the answer, tell me. Characteristic has a meaning in physics. You know. So I have to have an exponential decay, I see, okay. Exactly. Questions are easy. Eh? No, no. I said easy questions, but still everybody is thinking. <laughs> yes, so we write this as uh, 1 minus p squared e to the power s log of p. So the characteristic size of a cluster is minus 1 over log p. Unfortunately, it is positive.
So you have a percolating problem. You choose one site which is on. What is the probability that it is the member of a cluster of size S? It's this guy. Calculate it. It's a little algebra. But one minute. No, because if you sum this over S, it should get 1. So it's itself in the dominant. Sorry, I okay. didn't. I, This probability, if I add all, all clusters of size S, must come to 1. So the, in the denominator shouldn't be sum over S of S time, times N S to yeah. 1 if we sum over S? Yes, but it's the same thing. Suppose I write it like this. Then I say that S omega S of P is equal to 1. Yeah, right. Thank you. So you want to sum this?
Okay, we move to differential geometry now. Proof that all two dimensional Riemannian manifolds are conformally flat <laughs> Matteo is sitting in the back he doesn't know I'm doing differential geometry <laughs> So what is a conformally flat metric? A conformally flat metric is one that you can express in this form. So it is flat, but not completely flat because it has this coefficient. So if you have a metric like that, you say, it is conformally flat. So how do we how do we prove this? I give you one minute to think and then I explain. What is a Riemann manifold? Riemann manifold is a, is a mathematical space which has a metric, a Riemannian metric, defined locally on it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Simple. It's a <laughs> but when you say the theorem like that, it's a very important theorem. All Riemannian manifolds are flat. Definition of Riemann manifold? Riemann manifold is a topological space which is equipped with a metric on at least locally. That means you can hope that it's global, but usually you cannot. You just define it on a, on a coordinate patch. Okay. And this theorem also only applies to a coordinate patch. So the correct way is all two-dimensional Riemann manifolds locally are conformally flat. When I was a teenager, there was a cartoon called EQ Sun. Did you see it here? Did they show it in Italy? It was a Japanese cartoon. The character was called IQ san Japanese pronounced that IQ. San means master. So it's master IQ. And so if they had any problem, they ask him, and he goes like this, and then solve it. <laughs> yes. Linear, no. Rho is not small and it's not linear. It's rho is any function of z. Any function of x and y. So z and z bar. So to solve this, Remember that the metric can be written like that. <laughs> but 
but you can also write it like this. So the theorem says you can find mappings which takes these to zero, gz and gz are to zero, and you, left, you are left with because this is now a flat metric and this is a factor. So there are conformal transformations which takes you from there to here. Huh. Why is it? Yes. Uh, the question is find them. So if we know that they exist, but this question it says asks you to find the transformations. The proof that they exist is a mathematical proof, but uh, we don't need it. We know that they exist. There exist mappings which can map this form into that form. So in fact, if you like, I need to find W allows Z to go to W such that this goes into W, W bar, D, W, DW bar. That is uh, this move from here to here is, uh, is simple because what you do is that you take if I expand this, this is g11 dx squared g22 dy squared plus g12 dx dy and what I do is that I define z as x plus iy and put it in there and then what happens is that I have dx squared twice i dx dy minus dy squared g11. Um, sorry, this way is better. X is Z plus Z bar divided by 2. So it is DZ divided by 2 plus DZ bar divided by 2 S squared. So this comes out into 1 quarter of G11 DZ squared plus one quarter of G11 DZ DZ bar plus one quarter of G11 DZ bar S squared. You do that for all three terms and collect them. Eventually, you will end up with the bottom shape. But GZZ is some linear combination of G11, G22, and G12.
You have to okay. find a mapping which makes G one, you see, makes this combination G equal to zero. You find a map, you see this, the, under conformal mapping, G maps like this. So there is a mapping. X goes to X mu. So dx mu will be dw mu dx mu dx mu. Therefore, g mu nu equals dw dx g dw dx. Find this mapping. This is like a matrix. So if you take G as a matrix, it's M, G, M transpose. And I want it to look like that. Sorry, and I wanted to look. Like that. This, if you like, is a function. This is a mat matrix. The row x y. Yes. Yeah, so I should write row if you like. It's the row x y. Omega is a transformation of the coordinates. New co general, yes. It's not global. It has to be local. So I don't want to teach Riemannian geometry here. I'm avoiding your question. So when you have a Riemannian geometry, Riemannian manifold, usually you cannot cover it with one coordinate patch. For example, a sphere at least needs two coordinate patches, and they translate to each other on their overlaps. So this is only true in one coordinate patch. Is it just true for two only true for two dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. 
There are, there are manifolds in three and four dimensions which are conformally flat, but uh, they are special. You have to make an assumption on the metric to become conformally flat. Here, though, you don't have to make any assumption. It automatics the solution of that problem solves it. Yes. Yes, you have to find the W, which gives you the M, such that G in general goes to this. <laughs> okay, you have to solve, you, have, you set up a set of differential equations which uh, does this. Um, I have notes to do it, but it's really messy, it takes a lot of time. I can give them to you later. Uh, you, you just, you just find the equations and then you solve the equations. I mean, for each value, we have an equation for each couple of Yes. Okay. Uh, so for for uh, each couple of indices, we have a differential equation. So we have a set of differential equation that we have to solve, basically. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, the the beauty of it is that it becomes similar to Cauchy-Riemann conditions. But it needs a few lines of mathematics. Okay? Thank you. Give me, so we can play karaoke now. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay, and we should keep only the outer diagonal. Yes. Okay. Okay, let's go to the next problem. Fractals. This is a, called a Cantor set. Cantor set is a fractal that Cantor did not discover. <laughs> Somebody else discovered it, but we all call it Cantor sets because he, did, he proved a lot of theorems about it. So what you do is that you take the real line, let's say 0 to 1, you Take half of it and throw it away and repeat it. So this goes from zero to one third, and this goes from two thirds to one. You then repeat. And then repeat. Until infinity and also, of course, on the other side. You know, this is true about Ising model as well. Ising did not discover the Ising model. It was it was constructed by his supervisor, whose name was Lenz, and he gave it to Ising as PhD program, PhD problem. And mo as most PhD students do this, after six months, Ising went to Lenz and said, no phase transition in it. <laughs> Wrote his PhD and left. <laughs> in fact, Ising model was solved by Anzager after the war. And what did Ising do? He opened a shop selling uh, textiles. <laughs> okay, Cantor said, calculate the fractal dimension.
Don't find it on the internet. Solve it. <laughs> I don't get the sentence at all. What is the answer? Log two by log three. Log three. Log yes. Three. yes log two divided by log three. Gabriel, you finished? <laughs> okay. So how I do it, I have to cover this by lines. I cover, see here, because this fractal is smaller than the line, I cover it by line segments. So line segments at each level SK is one third. So at k equal to 1, a segment of one over length 1 over t will, will cover this guy. But how many do I need? Two of them, because there are two line segments at each stage. So nk is 2 to the power k. And fractal dimension is defined as minus log of nk divided by log of sk limit of k tending to infinity. So log 2 divided by log 3. Approximately 0 0.6. Does anybody, has anyone done the numerics? What is the, what is 0 0.6, what something? Does anybody know? The next digit, the next? Three. Three? 0.63. And it is equal to one over the fractal dimension of Of what? Serpinski triangle.
This is the action for the scalar field in arbitrary dimension. What we want is the energy momentum tensor. It is related to the variation of S with respect to G mu nu. So what is it? So of course one term is this, it's easy. It's just this determinant which is a little difficult. Hmm? The G on the square is a determinant. No, determinant of G. Ah, it's the determinant of G. This is determinant of G. Okay, so variation of this with respect to G, first term gives this one. The problem is this next term, which has variation of determinant of G.
اون سر کلاس حل کردیم It's a very very important rule The teacher is not confined to that area He can walk out Have you done this in the exercise classes? No, no Okay It's, a, it's an instrument which I use very effectively in class. What do you do? I walk in. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I walk in and then I go, hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, can you explain how you the... I got a little stuck. That's... I like. I got a little stuck. I asked her if she knows how to do it. Uh, okay. and, uh, this is a, so you have to get the variation of G with respect to G mu nu. So you can write it like that. So it becomes something like this. But the, I don't know how to resolve that. Some, I got, huh? I don't know how to do that, but if I have to, I write the determinant of G, just like D11, D22, minus D12, D22, and solve the four derivative. Is it wrong to do that? Yes, you can do that in two dimensions. Yes. But in D dimensions, which is I'm doing now, it's a little different. Yes, it's like a derivative, but it's a variation because this is not a parameter, it's a function. Yes, then it's the variation multiplied by some function, and this function has to be some function of g. There is no other choice. Yes? So it's just that what exactly is true, I don't know, but I know that this is the right answer. So the question is, what is the variation of the determinant of G? Is it the trace? Hmm? Is, is it related to the, to the trace of the trace? Or one half of the trace? You have the square root. Because we have the product of the given values. It doesn't, it doesn't help. But anyway, one, check that, D mu. mu nu is zero. So here, from here to here, g now is a constant. So I do this calculation 
the, the way we do this calculation is that at this stage, we take G to be a function of X and Y because we want to do this calculation. But once it is finished and we arrive at T, I now take G to be a constant, which is 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. So given that G is a constant now, show that the energy momentum is conserved. This conservation of energy and momentum is the foundation of physics. If we don't have it, we have nothing. So this is conservation of energy and momentum. Yes. In the last line, uh, the, the derivative uh, the mu, shouldn't it be the mu? No. And I think it should have a factor of one half here.
Okay, this term vanishes because equation of motion is d mu d mu phi. And this term exactly cancels this term. I just have to redefine my indices to, for it to become nice. So I bring this down, call it beta, call this alpha, put a G alpha beta here, and they become exactly equal. But this is a factor of one half here, which uh, in my derivative, I had it wrong. Yeah? So P is a massless scalar field? Massless scalar field. It's a massless scalar field here. You see, there is no mass. equation of motion. Do you derive the equation of motion from here, variation with respect to the mu of phi? You just get Laplacian of phi is zero. Or, in fact, this is more than Laplacian. It's box in any, any dimension. Number two, work out the trace of T. The trace of T is one minus T divided by two times something. So it is equal to zero at D equal to two. I don't understand your question. Um, let me just repeat. T mu nu is this. I take the derivative with respect to d mu. It comes to d mu, d mu phi. And then I have um, Uh, then I have this this guy. Yes. Then I have this term. Here these are two terms because derivative of each one of them a factor of two comes out. Two terms are exactly the same, so I just cancel factor. Now these two terms are exactly the same if I rewrite it with a metric. No, no, so you're okay now. Okay. So 
Yes. Those two terms are equal, yes. Yes. You have to just rewrite and rename the indices for them to look the same. So D, so the derivative of T mu nu is zero. This is conservation of energy and momentum. Now, next step, take trace of T. Trace of T is T mu T mu. In other words, you multiply with G mu nu and sum. The answer is 1 minus D divided by 2 D phi squared. See if you can get it. This is minus, this is minus, this is plus. So, but it means that in the end, there will be a minus sign. Here? Yes, yes. In front of everything. Or in front of everything. So this shows something is special at two dimensions. It doesn't happen in other dimensions. So at two dimensions, let's go back and rewrite the action. Same action in two dimensions. Is there anybody who did not drive this? There's many. <laughs> because you didn't want to. <laughs> yeah? The trace of T is G mu nu, D mu, D nu, phi. The, so sorry, the trace of G. The trace of G is D. So I, I don't get the one half. I get one minus D. There is a one half in front of G. Oh. Thank you. Well, Ziki, no, I don't touch God anymore. Well, 
Ahorita. Okay. So we see that this term comes out, 1 minus d over 2. So if you set d equal to 2, the trace of t vanishes. If the trace of t vanishes, then we have conformal invariance. So in two dimensions, I rewrite the action to see that it has obviously got conformal invariance. I write it in terms of complex variables. Now, the variation of S with respect to phi gives you the equation of motion, gives you d d bar phi equal to 0. Which means that phi is a function of z plus another function of z bar. This is the power of complex analysis that you solve a differential equation by choosing an ansatz. You don't need to solve anything. Just any function of z is a solution. Now, what I want is the green function. What is it? قدرتی بود داری شیطنت میکنی خودشون باید حل کنه طرف این شما میره رایف اقب تر کنیم بشن So you know how to find the green function? No. Nobody knows how to find the green function. Take a differential equation like this. <laughs> I 
I take this to be two-dimensional problem so that it is similar to our problem. But I put in an extra constant here to make it a little harder and a negative sign here. I want to find the green function. So what I do is that I take a Fourier transform. Take a Fourier transform, you get k squared plus m squared Fourier transform of g is equal to 1. Fourier transform of delta function is 1. So this equation is now algebraic, easy to solve. So you get g of k equal to 1 over k squared plus m squared. Yeah. Now, inverse transform, this is the Fourier transform of the green function. So if I inverse transform, it gives me the green function, i.e. the green function x minus, let's say just x, is e to the i kx over k squared plus m squared e to k. If I want x minus y, I will simply transfer here. So if I want to calculate this, now I have, I can do it by make, taking it to the complex plane. I have a pole at plus minus i m. So I take it to the complex plane, and there is a pole here and a pole here. So what I do is that I close the contour on the upper half plane. So this pole is picked up. So I have to set k equal to i m. It gives me a minus m x. divided by 2im. And then this, of course, can be written as k plus im, k minus im. One of them is the pole, jumps. The other one is 2im. So modulo some constants, <coughs> calculation is finished. However, what is interesting to me is the limit of m tending to 0, because this is what I want, which is only the first part of this operator. So in the limit of m tending to 0, See, this goes to 1, but this goes to 0, and so this is singular, and this, calcu this means that this calculation is no longer valid. And it is because at the, in the limit of m tending to 0, this comes to the real axis, and I have a pole on my contour. 
So I have to avoid this problem. And so what it does is that I have a pull on the contour and I have to make a little circle like that. And I now have to calculate this little circle here around the pole. So an integral like that has to be done for this pinching. When you look at this integral, you see that you have a divergence at k equal to zero and if you scale x away, if you define k prime as k as k prime over x, this x disappears, and between these two, you lose k prime. observe that you have a situation like that. So it, it cannot be that this is independent of x. Something is going wrong. And that is because when k is very much near 0, which is on this circle, actually you can take this equal to 1, and this is a log logarithm. So the answer is a log, log of x. Okay. So I suggest to you that the answer is minus log of z minus w squared. You can see that if you differentiate this once, and then twice you get 1 over z minus w, and it is singular at z equal to w like it should be. And it is regular everywhere else. So it behaves exactly like a green function. is a solution of this differential equation, and it is just not a solution exactly at z minus w. These, these things are called green functions. When you deal with the problem of differential equations, finding the Green function is very useful because it solves your boundary condition problem. But here for us it has a far more important use. What is the use? phi of z, phi of w, expectation value. So if you take this as now a quantum field theory, these become operators, and phi will have an expectation value, and the expectation value is the Green function. This is something from quantum field theory. I prefer not to prove it now.
So it is equal to minus log of z minus w squared. However, it cannot be a conformal field theory. It is conformal, it is quantum, but not a conformal field theory. Why? Because we know it's not dropping. So what do I do? The huh? problem is the problem is that it's not dropping. Um, in axiomatic field theory, they show that in if your field theory makes sense, you must always have this thing minus this thing to be a decreasing function of x. This is absolutely necessary because you want an effect here, an effect there, interacting with each other as they go away from each other to become independent. Maybe in, in, you, in the usual uh, standard situation, they become independent exponentially but at critical phenomena, they become independent by a power law. But they still, they become independent. You, they must be in decreasing. Log is not acceptable. But the, this, this correlation is negative. Minus log. Um, yes. Yes, it's negative. But it depends on the on the length scale you use here. You have to use a length scale because. This now doesn't have right dimensions, and this length is scale. So you add something. Okay. So you do it something smaller than the length of scale, it becomes positive. The, the negative sign is not important. It's not bad. <laughs> Playing a game? Okay, it's 4.30, but just give me five more minutes, I finish this argument, right? A little bit more energy. So what I do, I take, a, I take exponential of phi. Two dimensions this is allowed to do, taking exponential of operators in higher dimensions is not well defined, but here we can do it. And I, it, this is called the vertex operator. And mathematicians call this theory <coughs> vertex operator algebra instead of conformal field theory. We call it vertex operator algebra because of these vertex, ver vertex operators. Now what I want is, okay, now that I have defined this vertex operator, work out for me the correlator of two vertex operators if phi behaves like that. V alpha alpha.
Do you know this theorem in quantum mechanics? You don't know. You said yes first. <laughs> exactly, so you know. <laughs> so if you have two operators that don't commute, exponent, multiplication of exponentials of them gives you a plus sum plus a commutator B. I think one half. You have to use it to calculate that. If this is zero, then that's, it finishes here. So when you have two operators whose commutator is a C number, that's all you need to write. Okay, the next step is that if you put phi here, this is commutator of phi is related to the expectation of phi. So, V alpha Z, V alpha W is equal to e to the power of minus 2 alpha squared phi of z phi of w one half 
also equals to e to the power of minus alpha squared log of z minus w squared so equals to z minus w to power minus alpha squared z bar minus w bar to power minus alpha squared So V alpha is a conformal field theory with conformal dimension alpha squared, alpha squared. Yes. The cumulant expansion doesn't give the same result. It gives the same result. And I, I expected it would be only approximately the same. To our deadline, it gives the which, the which cumulant expansion? What are you talking about? Uh, here, um, if I re replace that with the exponential of uh, a series of uh, expectation values. Okay. It, and then is that is that because we despise the other terms in the expansion of the, the commutators? I don't know. You mean to write it like this, one plus write it like that. I have to see it on paper. I cannot imagine. <laughs> no, uh, what I didn't explain to you that here you have commutator of two phi's. 